Art Centric showcases the creative world of the Arvada Center. In this segment, we get an inside look at the making of A Christmas Carol, the musical. With sweeping skirts, infectious music, and the warmth of a Dickens village, the Arvada Center said bye-bye to any bah humbug darkness you might have expected from a production of The Christmas Carol. Right off the top, one of the things um, we're up against is obviously Christmas Carol is done by everybody and what makes ours different and what makes ours better. If the poor have to eat, let them beg upon the street or apply at the workhouse door. For one thing, it's a musical, something the Arvada Center excels in. For another, artistic producer Rod Lansbury searched for years before finding a version he feels has the right fit for Arvada Center audiences. I think it's a, it's a, a very fun, um, uplifting version. Um, that I can easily and honestly say is good for the whole family. In crafting his version of the story, Lansbury relied on his own research. You read the actual Dickens <laughs> novel, it's not that dark. Um, the novel itself is not. When you get into the ghost, they weren't this horrifying, dark thing going on. And so I really wanted to go back and, and look at what he did with, with the way he wrote the characters and why he wrote the characters. And it really, in my mind, is a very happy piece. 35 of the 39 cast members are local talents, 10 of them children. At the first rehearsal, Lansbury shared his vision for the story set in Victorian England. I have no intentions of taking this to a scary version. I don't intend to take it to a comic version. I just want it to be very much a feel-good Christmas story. That feel-good touch inspired the set design too. I talked to Brian and I said, okay, I know this is gonna sound weird, but I want those little collectible villages. <laughs> the result, a cozy and colorful Victorian street oozing with holiday charm. I want everybody to go home feeling wonderful from this show. And with that, I want everybody in this show to feel wonderful while they're doing it. The ultimate goal, says Lansbury, is that each and every production must connect to the audience. And that means they need to be able to connect to every one of your characters. It's huge, folks. As I said, biggest cast we've ever had, so it's going to take a lot of, of effort on our part and your part to keep things moving. Um, some huge dance numbers. Huge indeed. One week into rehearsals, choreographer Kitty Hilzebeck worked with actors offstage to tweak and refine the numbers. So it's trying to get that many people dancing and looking like they're big dance numbers without people fearing falling into the pit, <laughs> number one. And just really using that space. We have some large pieces that come in for the dance numbers too. Set pieces, large counters with a holiday feast on them. So it's tight. And when you're trying to do a big waltz or polka or something, that, um, to give it that spacious and you know, movement without uh, putting people in danger. <laughs> The length of the Fezziwig's ball dance scene presented challenges. Fezziwig's is long, so you just don't want to dance for seven minutes because people will be like, okay, you know, I've seen that, you know. Scrooge is working his way through the party and he's seeing Emily, his past love, and he's seeing himself as a young man and as a happy man and in love, but also he's starting to see those things within him that have created the man that he is in the current time. During rehearsals, while actors focused on dances and choreography, musicians began by working off-site to get their numbers down with music director David Nels. So bar 62 again. Three and four and one and two and three and four and one. And it's more relaxed. I mean, it gives us a, a sense of uh, almost like a party. <laughs> it's terrible to say that, but uh, you, you know, um, Keith, you are our, our drummer, and he's he's also the musical director assistant at the Arvada Center. He has this great space in the basement of his house. It's not far from the Arvada Center, so it's kind of relaxing. You know, you don't have that pressure of being in the business place. Now we're going into bar 77. Ready? Already, and one. Eight musicians make up the orchestra, and most of them multitask. We have two violinists, trombone, trumpet. The trumpet player is playing several different trumpets right now. We have a woodwind player who's playing saxophones, clarinet, several flutes. 
we have percussion and a string bass, and then me on keyboards, and I'll be taking care of any piano sounds, harpsichord, harp, and music box and organs. Unlike recent productions where the musicians were on set or behind the scenes then later revealed, for Christmas Carol, the musicians will be in the orchestra pit. Nels says that although that presents challenges when working with such a large cast, the choice was made in order to make sure audiences know the music is live. The one issue that keeps coming up is people think it's canned music. And, in, and there's no better way of saying, guess what, it's not canned music than having me waving my arms out of the pit. So that's why we're in the pit for this show, just to make sure that everybody knows that we are live. Yes, you mean more to me. The range of tunes for A Christmas Carol the Musical is wide. This is written by Alan Menken, who wrote Little Shop of Horrors, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast. So it's got a very Disney feel to it, very animated Disney style to it. But the musical styles range from Disney ballad type thing to, you know, raucous marching band type dance numbers. Some of them have more of a traditional sound and, and more of that period of, of um, Dickens. And then there's other things like Link by Link that just get silly and the ghosts are, are doing kind of more contemporary stuff um, as far as movement, but a whole different flavor. Along with choreographing the play, Hilzebeck landed on stage roles. I start off as a blind old hag, <laughs> which Rod likes to, you know, just typecast me in. <laughs> no. so, um, so I start off that way. I have seen you before. Later, Hilzebeck is the third ghost, ghost, the ghost of Christmas seen. future. A subtle touch that Lansbury called for was a distinctive entry sound for each of the ghosts. Sound designer Steve Stevens had fun with that, along with the myriad of other sounds needed for a Christmas carol. When the tombstone rises for Scrooge, it's basically a cinder block that I recorded and slowed it down and, and lowered it so that it sounds like it's this giant tombstone rising from the earth. And we'll use different manipulations on the microphones as well with, throughout the show. Not to know that years of ceaseless labor by immortal creatures must pass into eternity. During the shows, it's Grant Evenson's task to play back the special effects at just the right time in just the right way. We do that from a computer that's actually quite complex, much more complex than you know, it coming from like a CD or tape machine um, because it has multiple tracks, the ability to play multiple sound effects at the same time, playing out two different speakers at the same time. But his role during the show is much more complex than just controlling sound effects. I'm the person who operates the sound mixing console. So during the show, I'm adjusting volumes of the 50 or so sound sources that we have, including the actors and the band, the musicians. With dedicated pros behind the scenes, a large and talented cast, and a great vision for a feel-good holiday story, a Christmas Carol the Musical delivers a cheerful treat for the whole family, one that will make its mark in Christmas carols and the Colorado theater scene. There's no doubt with the quality of this cast and the abilities that are here, it is going to be, again, a unique, completely fresh version that even if you've seen Christmas Carol before, you can see this one and enjoy it as a fresh new start. A Christmas Carol the Musical runs through December 23rd. For tickets and showtimes, go online or call the box office at 720-898-7200.